We can all use encouragement and we'll find it together today with the Bible-based preaching and teaching of Dr. Don Wilton in a very unique situation. He'll be spending some time like we were last week in the studio talking about not only the end of the world, but the idea that beyond our life we live here, there really is an absolute certainty to life after death. Now to begin this, if, if you missed last week, we've got some highlights. Matter of fact, like popcorn, you're gonna see pop, 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 three key elements that'll help you catch up with where we are, and then more from Dr. Don about this wonderful subject. I believe in life after death in Christ. And so I sat down and I began to write this book. And it's just a novel, Christy, yeah. but it's, it's a story. And what I did, I, God just flowed through me and out of this experience, my own life experience, came the absolute certainty of life after death. Jesus said that there were two people, two men, and they both lived, they both died, one went to heaven and one went to hell. And by the way, Jesus told the story, and all of the Bible is true, but I pay particular attention for the fact that Jesus said this, and Jesus never tells us anything that didn't actually happen. This was not a fictional character. Jesus didn't call over the angels and say, angels, come over here, help me to make up a story so I can give people like Dr. Don Wilton something to preach about on the encouraging word or to write about in a book. I take what Jesus said to be what God is saying. And he told the story about the reality of these two people in their life after death. And I, God brought all of that together in these two main characters of mine. And I tell the story of them living their life, where they came from, their perspective, then how they died, and what happened to them after they died. Yeah, their choices. It came with not just their situation, but their choices, it seems like. That's the two correct. Characters, yeah. Two main characters there. The first part, essentially, and we, we're summarizing it, right? Yeah, right. The first part is about these two men okay, who grow up, their birth, their growing up, and their context. Very important. Who were they? What made them tick? They both get sick. I even described their diseases, and, and I consulted the medical community. I didn't just, I wrote, but I wrote with meaning and with purpose. What happens to a person when they die? Now, I want to know that <laughs> yeah. because we're all going to die. I've been around death so many years and I've held many, many hands and so many of our loved ones. We want to know, I, uh, what is this? It's this big mystery. What happens when you die suddenly? What happens if you get sick and you die slowly? What happens if you die in pain? What happens? Well, I just described these two men, my characters, and the process of dying. So that's the second part. The third part is what happens the moment they die. When you read this book, you really get a sense of urgency. Um, would you say that that urgency is directed only to unbelievers that might be reading this book? No, Christy, I, uh, uh, you know, that's a great question. I think the urgency when you read that book, because a lot of people have told me this, first of all, strikes the heart of people like me who believe. I've said to the Lord many times, Lord, thank you for giving me that blood clot. Thank you for me going through that surgery. Thank you for writing me in that in my heart. Thank you for putting me in that bed for two weeks where I couldn't move. And thank you for letting me write the absolute certainty of life after death. Because I believe I did it for one reason. My daughter Shelley. And if that is the only reason, Christy, it was worth everything I thought I ever did. All right, well, you might have already seen our interview about the uh, first interview, anyway, of The Absolute Certainty of Life After Death. It's a book that Dr. Wilton wrote, and we've had a chance to kind of get your insight, Dr. Wilton, on the characters in the book, the setting, the different parts of the book that really lead us through an incredible journey. But you talk about journey and you've had a personal experience directly related to writing this book that impacted your own family. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, it, it's just, I'm, I'm going to use a phrase here, but I love talking about the subject, about the absolute certainty of life after death. And probably, Christy, as we've been going through this in, 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 our, in our previous talk together, 
because it's so personal. You know, and I want you to think about that. And I, I think everyone who's listening today is thinking personally. So if you think even of the two characters, you know, Billy Bob, and, uh, and, and, then, and you think of his life alone. He wasn't, he wasn't just an island unto himself, and yet he was. He was this, he was this one person. And you and I are that one person. And the meaning of this book, the subject of it, when Jesus spoke about two people who lived and died, that's me, that's you, that's all of us. You're in this, I'm in this, you're in it, Christy. None of us are left outside of the love of God. Here's what the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's you, that's you, Christy, that's me, Don, whosoever believes in him will not die, but will receive the absolute certainty of life after death. Now, when did you receive that personally in your life? When did you ask Jesus into your heart? What's your story? Well, in many ways, um, my life is a mix between the two characters uh, because I grew up in Africa and uh, I grew up in, in a, a very exciting world, uh, an extremely adventurous world and uh, where we had wide open spaces, mountains, rivers and waterfalls and beaches and great white sharks. And uh, we didn't have television. First TV I ever saw, I was 21 years of age. And, uh, you know, those things just were not part of our life. Our life was one big adventure. Uh, whether it was riding motorbikes, surfing, fishing, uh, hiking, jumping off this and doing that. And so I grew up in this household where my own mother and father didn't know Christ, but when I was about six years of age, they both came to know Christ. So think of my mom and dad. My mom and dad, without going into any details, businessman, beautiful wife, home, three wonderful sons. The middle one was just terrific. Um, that's me. And um, everything that opens and shuts, but my dad didn't know Jesus. And then he gave his life to him. And you know what? Four years ago, my dad stepped over into the absolute certainty of life after death. The age of almost 90, he went to heaven. I know he's there and I know he's alive and I know he's real. But there was a time when he didn't. So I grew up in a home like that, but I myself did not know Jesus. I even went to boarding school in Africa, which is very typical of the British colonial rule, and it's very much so in England even to this day, the royal family, you know, Prince Charles and, and Prince William, all, they all had their stints. So it was very much ingrained into us. I was boarding schools up in the mountains of Africa, far away from home. I was just eight years of age. And in fact, I remember as, as a nine-year-old making a decision to give my heart to Jesus as a nine-year-old, okay? And I don't discount that. In fact, for me, Christy, what is not known is back there in the early 60s, um, I would get on my horse <clears throat> and I would ride up into the mountains of Zululand by myself, bareback, we didn't have saddles, and I had a little record player on my back and Zulu tracks in the Zulu language from the Africa Inland Mission. And I would ride way up in the mountains and Zulu tribesmen would just gather everywhere and I would stop and I would wind up my little record player. And, and then I'd put a little seven single gospel Zulu record on there. And it would wind up and then it would have singing in Zulu, and then someone would talk about Jesus. Ije sutanda wena. I mean, I can still speak it. Jesus loves you. Ije sutanda wena. Jesus loves you. 
And here I am, a 9, 10, 11 year old boy, all on my own. I'm convinced that that was when God was putting His stamp on me to go across the nations and tell people about Jesus. I'm convinced. However, from the age of 12 to the age of 23, I increasingly just drifted away. Got caught up in the wrong crowd, uh, became a teenager. I described some of it in some of my characters there. We were naughty. We got into everything. I was never bad, uh, never stepped over the line, but I got awfully close. And uh, uh, I mean, I wasn't interested in school. I even flunked out of the 11th grade completely. And I wasn't a, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was an intelligent person. That must have been very stressful for your parents. Oh, oh, I can't imagine. You know, I'd stay out late at night and get into boxing and martial arts and I'd be out running, roaming around the streets and getting into fights and, and all that sort of stuff. Nobody around me th even thought that I belonged to Jesus. You know, now again, I wasn't a, I wasn't a, a, a deeply cussing, bad living, but I, there was no semblance of anything spiritual in my life. Maybe deep down inside, it just bothered me because I think I knew better. And my dad was a preacher, right? So I ended up going back to Civvy Street. First day, day number one. I come out of the bush and out of the desert, the Kalahari, Namib deserts of South Af Southwest Africa. And I'm tanned like you can't imagine. And I've been in the bush all these years and uh, go to church. And the only reason I went to church, and I'm just confessing, I'm sorry, is because pretty girls went to church. I'd been out there in the desert long enough, thank you. And there she was on the second row. All I could see was the back of her had no idea I'd be married to her now for 44 years and that I'd be so in love with her. I had no idea, but I saw her. I went to church. God had a purpose going on. And even then I didn't give my life to Christ, but boy, did she knock my socks off. And she lived for the Lord in every way. And through her influence and her prayers and the prayers of my mother who never stopped praying for me, I could feel God speaking to me and then it happened. And I went to church one day and I'm telling you, it's as though Jesus walked down that aisle and stopped right next to me and said, Don Wilton, I died for you and I love you. And without me, you're nothing. And without me, you cannot go to heaven. You will go to hell. It doesn't matter where you've served in the military. It doesn't matter what kind of veteran you are. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter how well you play cricket or rugby. And it doesn't matter that you've got a beautiful wife. It doesn't matter what motor car you drive and it doesn't matter that your dad is a great preacher. You don't know me. And it was right there. I got on my knees and I said, Lord Jesus, if I gave my heart to Jesus when I was eight in boarding school in the mountains of Zuland, I want to thank you. But I can't go through life on an if. I need to know. I don't want to go through life thinking I might go to heaven you tell me that I can know that I'm going to heaven, that the absolute certainty of life after death in Christ is real, that like Billy Bob, I can die and be transported by the angels. And in my book, I describe this beautiful scene of this royal escort coming to pick up this man and just carry him into the presence of Jesus before he meets his mother and, and the mansions in heaven and that beautiful scene that I described. Beyond belief. Oh yeah. And I hadn't even thought about writing this book. But I'm telling you, that's what happened to me, Christy. And I got on my knees and I trusted Jesus. My life has never been the same since. So that was an eternal choice that you made that's yes. going to affect you for all eternity. Absolutely. What would you say to somebody that says, you know, God is a loving God. He's merciful. He could never send anyone to where Albright went in the book. Well, evidently he does. He loves us so much that he's provided the means for us to not go there. There's been no greater love shown than that Jesus would lay down his life for the likes of me. It's the wrong question to say, well, you know, God loves me, therefore he won't send me there. 
That's like turning to you or me as parents with young children and saying, how much do you love your kids? So here I have, I've got this roadway outside my home and there's a lot of traffic on it and I've got a three-year-old child. How do I show my ultimate love? Ultimate love is that I don't let him go there. And I provide the means by which a child won't go there. And what does that mean? Take my hand, son. Take my hand, my daughter. Cling to me. Follow me. Listen to me. I'm your daddy. I'm your mother. I build that. I make it possible for my child not to go. I don't sit there and say, well... There's traffic there. That car could ride over and seriously hurt my little boy, my little girl. So I'm just going to say, well, just go ahead and do it. God loves you. God loves you, my friend. And he loves me. And he loves us so much that Jesus came to die for us on a cross, that he would do that for me. You know what I've come to discover? I've come to discover that what Jesus Christ has done for me, he'll do for every single person. Every single person, regardless. And you know, when my daughter Shelley gave her heart to Jesus by reading a novel, a book that her dad wrote, you know, Christy, it wasn't really about the book. It was about the fact that Jesus made possible the means by which my daughter would see and come to know the love of God in Christ Jesus. How is this book reflected in your life? Just in a passion. Um, I don't ever get tired of talking about it. Um, I don't ever get tired of reading it. I don't read it to impress myself. It just reminds me all the time of the incredible precious privilege that I have with thousands of my fellow partners and believers, even through the encouraging word across the country, of being able to take something like this and give it to somebody. Do you know that I've heard great stories of people that have taken even a novel like this and just left it in a friend's mailbox and has said nothing. And the friend came by, opened it up, saw this book and just sat down, began to page through it and the final analysis gave their heart to Jesus. So it's just a, an instrument. You know, God uses us. You know, he'll use you when when you make a phone call, when you go and visit somebody, if you, if you serve in a soup kitchen, if you provide something for people in need, you offer a helping hand. Um, and he uses you when you witness, when you speak out, when you talk. You say, man, I want to invite you to give your heart to Jesus. He uses people when they go on a mission trip. He uses people when they give their money to provide for somebody to go on a mission trip. We're all partnered together. So I see the absolute certainty of life after death as yet another link in the beautiful chain of God's grace. It's just one. Joining together with hundreds of thousands of other means and opportunities to make a difference for Christ. So how has that impacted me, Christy? It has. It has because God has shown me that he will take even someone like me from the hills of Zululand <laughs> and with all the joys in my life will, gosh, even give me the opportunity to write a book. Yeah. Um, you know what? Can I tell you something staggering? I'm, I'm, I'm not a world famous novelist. I'm, I'm not a fashionable writer. I have no aspirations. <laughs> uh, you know, um, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, I don't have $50 billion. 
Now I'd like to, if someone would like to put me to the test, yeah, I'm very happy with what I've got. I'm not a, you know, number one this and a, right. that's not what I do. I'm, I just like to tell people about Jesus and I'm someone's friend and a, and a father and a son, but boy, that has changed my life. Well, uh, Billy Bob kind of reminds me of you because he was always so enthusiastic to look for that next opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. And do you know who my best friend is? That was his line. Um, yeah, so that's right. He, he tried to get people to understand how much they needed Jesus. Yeah. But Albright never got that point. He never did. He had chances though. He had, he had plenty of opportunities. You know, sadly, Christy, I... I wonder how many people today are in eternal hell that passed by a thousand opportunities to give their lives to Christ. Perhaps sat on their hands. Perhaps got right up to the edge. And you know, Christy, that's why this is important for you. And that's why it's important for every single person who worships with us and who shares with us, this is about you. And that's why I just want to ask you if you'd give your heart to Jesus. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to fly to the moon and back. I, I'm, I'm not asking you to. I'm just asking you to do what Jesus has done for all of us because he loves you. That's time, isn't it? It's time to say yes to Jesus. And I, I'm going to tell you something. When you give your life to Christ, not only do you receive forgiveness, you're cleansed. But He enters your heart and He gives you meaning and purpose. And get this. The Bible says that He writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. And once your name is written in God's book, nobody can erase it. Nobody can take it out. Isn't that something? And it means that the instantaneous moment that you die, you're going to be transported by the angels right there to be seated at the feast table of the king. Would you give your heart to Jesus? Would you pray this prayer with me today? I'm going to pray with you right now. You pray this prayer. You make this prayer your prayer. Dear God, I know that you love me. I know and I believe that Jesus died on a cross just for me. And I know that I'm a sinner. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right now, at this moment, I repent of my sin and I confess all my sin to Jesus because He's the one who died on a cross to take my sin away. But I know that He's alive because God raised him from the dead. Today, I invite you to come into my heart. I take you into my life as my Lord and Savior. And I know that as I say this, you are writing my name in God's book in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my friends. Thank you. God bless you. Pick up the phone, call us, go to our web, get in touch with us. We want to send you some great information. We want to get alongside of you. Hey, I want to rejoice with you. Let me hear from you today. God bless you. And if I don't see you in Montana or Utah or Alabama or California or Massachusetts or wherever it might be that you and I might be, and I don't ever see you. Guess what? You and I are going to see each other right there in heaven, seated together, celebrating in God's presence. That, my friend, is the absolute certainty of life after death. In my mind's eye, I see you agreeing with Doc. Yes, I'll see you at that time, that end of the world, when we're all together with Jesus because we belong to Jesus, or maybe you're going, I don't know if I'm gonna be there. Here's how you know. You give your heart to Jesus Christ. It's as simple as repeating a prayer right after me in your heart, not about the right words, but about saying, okay, God, I believe in you, Jesus. I know you went to the cross of Calvary 
And Lord, I believe that I need to turn my life over to you. I'm through trying to run it myself. I give my life, my heart, my future to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, that first step is critical to just accepting Christ as your Savior. And if you've done that, let us put some resources in your hands. Dr. Don has prepared some great stuff that he would love to put in your hands right now. Give us a call, let us send it to you, or visit us online at theencouragingword.org and begin the next steps. One of the things we'd like you to know is we'd love to encourage you to pray with you and for you. That phone number, jot it down, store it in your cell, 24 hours a day. That will reach you with one of us ready to talk, to listen, to pray, to connect you with resources. Just know we are here to encourage you. Hello, my friends. I want to speak to you personally today from my heart to yours. I don't think there is ever a better or more important time for us to respond to our world by standing up for righteousness. Now with this in mind, I would like to invite you to become an encourager ministry partner. You see, together we can impact lives both now and for all time and all eternity. The Encouraging Word is a viewer and listener supported ministry. And to know that you are standing with me financially enables me to move forward with confidence to do the work God has called me to do. So please call the number on your screen and just simply say, I want to become an encourager. Thank you so much for helping me. Hello, my friends. Thank you for watching The Encouraging Word on YouTube. If you were blessed by this message, would you like it, comment, and perhaps would you subscribe and get connected with us? In fact, if you want to discover more about The Encouraging Word, visit our website at tewonline.org. God bless you today.